Democrats and establishment media types ignore economic fundamentals at their own peril. UNFTR. Today, we're looking at the absolutely horrible, patronizing, and tone deaf column from one of the most venerated economists at the New York Times. I've long considered Paul Krugman to be a rational, empathetic, liberal economist. Liberal in the modern sense, that is, not in the classical liberal economist vein that neoliberal Chicago school economists portray themselves. Anyway, while not an acolyte of Krugman, I found great insight in his 2012 book, End This Depression Now, while I was deep in my journey to understand the value of a Keynesian approach to the financial crisis. So I've kind of brushed off criticisms of him as an establishment mouthpiece for the most part, choosing to see him as autonomous and independently minded among the dismal scientists. And I still find his analyses accessible and valuable. With that disclaimer in mind, I was profoundly disappointed in one of his recent opinion pieces about Bidenomics and his rather patronizing tone toward the middle and working classes. So here's the concluding paragraph of his recent column on inflation. Quote, Consumers still have very negative views about the economy, although it's becoming unclear whether those negative views will hurt Democrats much in November. But politics aside, it seems clear that Bidenomics worked pretty well, end quote. Ah, Krugman's better than this. But wishful thinking abounds with the specter of Donald Trump looming on the horizon. So I'll forgive him this horrible take in the hope that he comes to his senses after a Harris victory in November, but I do feel a correction is in order. Now, same publication, same publication date, here's an excerpt from a troubling piece about inflation, jobs, and consumer confidence. Quote, New data showed signs of the labor market cracking across a range of metrics. People reported leaving or losing jobs, marked down their salary expectations, and increasingly thought that they would need to work past traditional retirement ages. The share of workers who reported searching for a job in the past four weeks jumped to 28.4%, the highest level since the data started, up from 19.4% in July 2023." End quote. In fact, the next day, the data were released and it showed that job growth was overstated by 818,000 over the 12 months leading into March, so there's likely more revisions on the way. So how do we square this circle? Let's start by looking out where Krugman points the finger. Quote, so we have basically made a full round trip on inflation. But what brought it down? Before I get there, let's talk about two kinds of people who refuse to acknowledge this good news. First, there are inflation truthers, people who claim that the official numbers can't be trusted and that inflation isn't really way down. So considering the job numbers that we've been told were accurate for the last year and a half were just whacked by nearly a million, you can hardly blame people for not trusting the data. And then Krugman employs a typical tactic among elite opinion writers. My information is better than yours. Your financial stress doesn't matter. You might be struggling to pay your bills, but that's not what the charts and graphs say. Inflation is down to pre-pandemic levels. It's lower than other countries. We won. Stop complaining. The Biden administration did its job. If you don't believe it, then you're a truther engaging in conspiracy level denial. Not mentioned in his essay is that inflation is cumulative. We haven't experienced disinflation, only a slowing of inflation, which means that prices are still going up, just at a slower rate, and the baseline is higher than it has been in decades. He also conveniently overlooks the fact that other OECD nations he's comparing us to have things like, oh, I don't know, free education, robust social safety nets, paid family leave, and subsidized health care. He then employs another tried-and-true tactic of elitists. Shame. Quote, since 2019, which is the year people usually cite when saying that things used to be better, consumer prices have risen 22.6%, which has many people upset. But average hourly wages have gone up 25.3%, while wages for non-supervisory workers are up 28.2%. If you want to see prices go down substantially, are you also in favor of big wage cuts? End quote. Oh my God. Krugman acts as though wage growth and inflation growth are 100% correlated, that it's a one-to-one. -one. So if prices went up X and your wages went up X plus two, well, you're better off than you were before. So how would you like it if we just cut your wages? Stop complaining. But this is one of the most hollow analyses that I think I've ever seen from him. It's a take more worthy of Thomas Friedman than Paul Krugman. 
So here's where it all falls apart in a matter of seconds. Hourly wages did increase from an average of $25 to $30 in the time period that he mentions. So there's your 25% increase, more or less. Assuming these hourly wages are for 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, that's a gross income of $62,400. So the take-home pay from that would be somewhere around $46,800 per year or $3,900 per month. The Bureau of Labor Statistics breaks down household expenditures on the other side of the ledger, though, reporting, quote, a single-person household spends an average of $4,337 on monthly expenses. So our typical hourly wage American working 40 hours a week every single week of the year, no breaks, no sicknesses, no illnesses, will have a gap in the best case scenario of $437 per month or $5,200 per year. Experian reveals that the average American is now carrying $6,500 in credit card debt at a rate of 22%. In other words, wage growth and inflation is not a one-to-one -one relationship, and the delta between the two is compounding at alarming rates, thus leading to the pressure that people like Krugman are so quick to dismiss. And for what it's worth, I think it's worth a great deal, by the way, 55% of the American workforce earns hourly wages. This is the elite mind trap. Top earners have experienced staggering growth over the past several decades. They've completely pulled away from the pack. When high interest rates punish wage earners with things like variable rate mortgages or inflation shows up in the grocery bills or at the pump, it severely constricts people's ability to plan, save, or just survive. I mean, people who are one catastrophic incident away from insolvency or even a small incident that costs thousands of dollars that people don't have. So on the flip side, when interest rates go up for high-income individuals and wealthy families, so do their portfolios. In fact, they win on all sides and compound their returns with a combination of secure fixed income investment vehicles and safe harbor in equities that are still increasing because companies are buying back their shares and taking advantage of customers with inflated prices. That's why P.E. ratios, which is the stock price relative to earnings, are on the rise again. Institutional investors are still flooding the market with capital they accumulated from the low interest rate years, and companies are continually shrinking the pie through buybacks to inflate valuations. So wealthy investors are winning on both sides of the equation. I'm by winning. I win here and I win there. Now what? That's why the inflated jobs numbers are a real kick in the teeth, and why we ignore the travails of the working class at great peril. This report is a crack in the armor of mainstream economists and the brain trust at the Federal Reserve who have been pointing endlessly at jobs data to prop up the theory of the dual mandate. Now, we've talked about this before, but it bears repeating how the mandate is anachronistic in the modern era, especially where the United States is concerned. The dual mandate of the Federal Reserve dictates that its tools exist to maintain a certain level of employment, meaning a chunk of the population must be unemployed in order to maintain moderate levels of inflation. So the underlying belief here is that a segment of the population must be perpetually unemployed in order to keep a minimum threshold of labor demand. In turn, this allows for the suppression of wages in order to keep consumers from overspending and thereby overheating the economy. Otherwise, we run the risk of what they call the wage price spiral, a never-ending doom loop of increasing wages, forcing corporations to raise prices to maintain profitability. That's not really how the world works, though. Let's unpack this a little bit with a brief example from history. Full employment during World War II was taught to us as an outlier. It was a one-off, a reflection of the wartime economy that couldn't last because the government was running unsustainable deficits. But... When the world's industrial economies were reshaped during Bretton Woods to allow for flexibility in monetary policy, it relieved the artificial burden of the physical gold standard. Now, conflicting paradigms were at play in the building of the modern post-war economy when superpowers emerged on the international stage. But if we look at the character of the wartime economy and the decades thereafter, it teaches us something about market controls, centralized planning, the benefits of full employment, and the role of taxation to curb bad corporate behavior. Central planning, price controls, heavy regulations, industrial subsidies, 
expanded welfare benefits, public works programs, increased union membership, and high corporate tax rates were hallmarks of the U.S. economy during what most economists consider the golden era of prosperity and growth. All measures that are today written off as socialist in nature, anti-democratic, and an affront to capitalism in the free markets. The Chicago School, as we've covered extensively, changed all of that. Say it loud, say it with me, yo, yo f Milton Friedman. Today, the federal government, mainstream economists, and media pundits judge economic policy by three events. Stagflation in the 1970s, the financial crisis, and now the pandemic. There's a dissertation in there somewhere about why these outlier events are weighted so heavily in our policies and on our minds, but Krugman's piece is mired in this type of thinking. His defense of Bidenomics is rooted in the idea that the government exists to invest in large-scale public works projects just to allow the free markets the time to develop around these initiatives. So in this scenario, the government is nothing more than an early-stage venture capitalist. It's why the recently released Harris economic vision rings so hollow, even while Project 2025 would be nothing less than catastrophic. You see, the former ignores the fundamental flaws in sustaining a free market model that simply isn't working for the vast majority of Americans. The latter would destroy the last vestiges of safety nets and protections for the poorest Americans, the working class that exists in perpetual precarity, the dwindling middle class, and even the bulk of the so-called upper middle class. So what does the Harris Plan really say? Well, for one, it calls for federal limits on price increases for food producers and retailers. Now, the mechanisms to enact measures such as these aren't really defined, and so it's hard to imagine how executive orders and regulations could even withstand court challenges or what metrics would even be used to determine who's price gouging and where. More on point, though, is her plan to crack down on mergers and acquisitions in the food industry, such as the FTC's ongoing efforts to scuttle the Kroger-Albertsons merger. But what are we to do with the fact that a quarter of all grocery sales in the country are from Walmart? And the percentage of online sales that they have was 37% as of Q2 2024. See, that's a trend that's only going to continue. Further up the supply chain, we also know that just a handful of conglomerates control food manufacturing from the protein industry to consumer goods. So we have to do more than just prevent future mergers. We have to do some good old fashioned trust busting, but that's not in the plan. Now, in terms of housing, which was another anchor part of her proposal, Harris is calling for a suite of tools from tax incentives for new housing, starter funds for first time home buyers, a cap on bulk home purchases by speculative investors, and a $40 billion investment fund for affordable housing initiatives. These are all fine. I mean, really, they're just fine. But it completely ignores renters. And by the way, it does nothing to curb the appetite of sellers to increase prices, thereby negating the incentive scheme. Now, the rest of the plan reinforces Biden-era plans to bolster the insurance market, reduce prescription drugs, and an array of tax credits. It's all fine. Really, it's fine. But that's all it is. It's just fine. These are bandages on a hobbled system at a moment when we need structural change and paradigm shifts. We're tinkering on the margins again. And as I've said before, you can't eat a tax credit. So what's the fear? What's really going on here? Why the fear among politicians and economists and pundits about things like universal health care, Medicare for all? or full employment, or direct payments, paid family leave, government subsidizing things and then not letting go of them to the free markets. What is this mindset? We know that during World War II, we operated, and, and the years thereafter, we operated exactly in this way. And for the next 25 years, we had the mo most robust economy that we've ever had. And during the pandemic, when people received checks directly into their bank accounts, the research showed that the bulk of these funds went toward rent, food, and paying down debt. So the only people that lost in that scenario were the credit card companies. Now, the mainstream economists suggests, or just state outright, well, that, that's the reason why inflation gripped the United States. But it doesn't explain why it literally gripped every other country in the world. Nor does it address the fact that corporations have recorded the highest profits in history since the pandemic. See, the answer to all this is that corporate America just took all of the excess money running through the economy. 
And our system more than allows for this behavior, it encourages it. How does our system encourage this behavior? Here's a couple of examples. Since the Clinton administration, corporate executives have been incentivized by share price, not performance. Deregulation has created a permissive environment that encourages corporations to cut corners and periodically tank the economy. Bailouts codified recklessness in all sectors of the economy, and here's how they all work together. Okay, so most modern CEOs have rational salaries and exorbitant incentive packages based upon share price performance. Now, the latter is taxed far lower than normal wages, so executives are incentivized to bolster share prices rather than core performance metrics. Deregulation allows for these corporations to consolidate and eliminate competitive forces that otherwise protect buyers and consumers. And the bailout culture eliminates the downside of risky behavior because the government has demonstrated that it will step in to secure corporations over consumers first and foremost. This comes in the form of direct cash payments or preposterously low interest rates. The corporate execs have used these funds over the years to buy back stock, which raises the share price and the cycle continues. The long bet placed by the Biden administration was that government investments into certain industries and the American infrastructure would encourage and bolster growth. Totally fair. It was quite the gift of the corporate class, but it's not something we can really be angry with considering these investments were so overdue. And some of them went into industries that employ millions of Americans. Building resiliency into the core infrastructure of the US and investing in some green sectors is hardly a bad thing. But it's also true that the era of cheap money is officially done. And the Federal Reserve has been a lot less likely to purchase toxic assets outside of the rare occasion that it has to step in to prop up overnight settlement markets, but that's for another day. But because we didn't change the systems and the structures that led to severe economic downturns, corporations have sidestepped the free government money issue by raising prices on American consumers with impunity. This was the big blind spot of the Biden plan and why the bottom-up, middle-out strategy was plagued with issues from the start and has thus far failed to take hold for most Americans struggling with high interest rate debt, wages that have begun to stagnate once again, and consumer good prices that are crushing the majority of the population. The Harris plan is a doubling down on Bidenomics. And people like Krugman are providing cover for what is essentially this generation's version of trickle-down economics. Tax credits for the poor, everything else for the rich. If Krugman's conclusion was more honest, it would be a little more palatable. Bidenomics, and now by extension, theoretically, Harrisonomics, is amplifying the status quo. But it's definitely better than tearing it all down which is what we can expect under a Trump administration and a Trump-controlled Congress, God forbid. So whether you're hoping for the best or you're bracing for the worst, either way, you gotta go forward with eyes wide open. And here endeth the lesson.